Welcome to Young Adult Catholics, a podcast for young adult Catholics. My name is Janelle. I'm Kayan. And I'm Daniel. We are going to be having a special guest with us today, Michelle Ballestero, as you can see here. And What's up, everyone? <laughs> yes, and we're going to have it on the topic of being a pro-life young adult Catholic. So I'm so excited for this episode. So, Michelle Ballestero. I knew her, um, or I got to know her through Cal State Fullerton. She was my very first Bible study when um, I was on campus. And she is the type of person who really seeks to encounter you and have um, a genuine relationship with you when she first meets you and gets to know you. And she's really, um, I'm going to be honest, like she... Meeting her was a pivotal moment in my life and growing my, in my relationship with God. So I'm very, very grateful to have her today. Um, praise God. Like she's now a missionary, a focused missionary, Ooh. fellowship of Catholic University students. I believe that's right. Okay. <laughs> and so um, from that, um, Michelle, if you could share a little background about yourself and um, also share like what cultivated your desire for pro-life advocacy. Sure. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks. For, first of all, just thank you for each of you for this podcast and for having me on. It's a huge honor. Um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kaya. That was beautiful. Um, and praise God. Um, so, yeah, a little bit of background. Um, like Kaya said, um, my name is Michelle, and I currently um, work for the Fellowship of Catholic University Students as a program director um, here at our headquarters. And um, I, so, from the beginning, I grew up um, in a Catholic family, so I'm number six of eight. So um, being pro-life and living in a culture of life is something that um, my parents definitely instilled in me coming from a big family. Um, and as a child, my parents would take us to uh, pray in front of um, Planned Parenthood um, for the women that were going in there that were contemplating abortion or women who had had abortion for them to encounter the Lord's mercy. Um, there's actually a really cute picture of me and my brother both holding signs and I'm like four and he's like six. Um, and his, his sign says abortion is murder and mine says like Jesus forgives and heals. Um, it's, it's a cute picture. I love to share it with people. Um, and then, yeah, so apart from my own family, I stumbled upon live action as a teenager um, which is a like investigative journalism group um, that aims to um, expose the horrors of abortion, um, specifically Planned Parenthood, and they've done a lot of investigative journalism, um, revealing yeah what Planned Parenthood does with uh, the fetal remains of children who are aborted, how um, yeah Planned Parenthood uh, basically gives women the option of abortion, um, and very rarely do they help them to actually choose life. Um, and things like that is what live action does. And so I, yeah, learned a lot of what I know now as far as what abortion actually is, how it actually happens, um, what it's like for a woman to walk in and um, have a conversation about abortion. Um, and then as also as a teenager in some faith formation classes at my parish, um, I learned a lot about what the church teaches um, about not just abortion, but um, like life issues regarding end of life issues, during life issues, whether it's, um, yeah, in vitro fertilization, um, marriage and families, um, immigration, um, service to the poor, things like that, um, or like euthanasia. So I learned a lot about that as a teen um, in those classes. And then um, through my encounter with Focus as a student in college, I encountered the Sisters of Life who are, yeah, so inspiring. They're a religious order that take an extra fourth vow uh, to protect and enhance the sanctity of life. Um, and encountering them, I had a deeper encounter of my own um, value and dignity and worth as a beloved daughter of the Father, um, as well as them helping me um, accompany a friend through a crisis pregnancy and them getting me to resources in my areas and just coaching me on yeah, how I can better accompany her um, and help to empower her to make the best decision for her and her child. Um, yeah, and then apart from that, just lots of reading of uh, our, yeah, our Holy Fathers who have written beautifully on um, life and 
the dignity and value of life, um, particularly um, St. Pope John Paul II in his Theology of the Body and um, Evangelium Vitae, as well as uh, Pope Paul VI and his um, encyclical on human life, Humana Vitae. So there's that. Oh, wow. Drops a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Wow. I like, even though I knew you, like, I didn't know all of that background and like, even just the history from even being a young child to now, and just the development that like God has literally done with you to be where you are today. Like, wow, praise God. For those at home wondering, what is, what does it mean to be pro-life? And then why is it important to be pro-life? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm going to start by reading something from the Catechism of the Catholic Church about human life. Um, so this is paragraph 2258, and it says, um, human life is sacred because from the beginning it involves the creative action of God, and it remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator, who is its sole end. God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning until its end. No one can under any circumstance claim for himself the right directly to destroy an innocent human being. Um, so with that foundation, um, yeah, what it is to be a pro-life Catholic is someone who um, knows, what, knows that life is a gift, first and foremost from God, um, and secondly from our parents. Um, and life is a gift at every stage in every circumstance. Um, so essentially no matter how someone came into the world or what someone is going through or experiencing um, they are a gift and that they are sacred and they um, deserve to be treated as such um, as a catholic and uh, i think something that's important to distinguish distinguish here is that yeah we're currently in an election year right so there's a lot of talk about different issues um pro-life and abortion being one of the biggest issues um but for catholics being pro-life is not just the issue of abortion, it's the issue of everything from conception um, to natural death. Again, like I kind of spoke about a little bit in um, earlier, um, it's honoring life in every stage. Um, so this means that we don't just care about um, children who are in the womb, we care about mothers who um, are in the crisis pregnancy. Um, not only that, but um, yeah, if someone is poor, homeless, sick, terminally ill, the elderly, anything like that. We, we care for them and seek to meet um, their material needs um, and uh, support and provide for them in any way that we can, even if that's just seeing someone who's experiencing homelessness on the street and offering them a smile because I don't have anything else to give them, right? Or just acknowledging them as a human being and saying, hi, my name is Michelle, what's your name? Um, and how can I pray for you? Um, so yeah, that's really, yeah, what it means to be a pro-life Catholic. Um, and I think especially as a young adult, um, it's really important to understand, uh, this big worldview, um, versus just like a one issue thing, because, um, it affects us in our everyday life. Um, I'm sure, um, you have friends who experience a lot of anxiety, um, or depression or just hopelessness. Um, and yeah, amongst our age group, things like, are um, huge. Um, abortion um, is, the, is the biggest um, percentage of abortions occur um, in young adults. And that's like 46% of abortions happen um, with women under the age of 25. Um, and so as young adult Catholics, it's important for us um, to, to know this um, and to live it and first and foremost, receiving our own dignity from God um, and asking him to reveal that to us um, and being able to treat others with that because um, it's like the first time we're not under, right, the, the roof of our parents' house or, uh, and we're like trying to make like big life decisions for ourselves, whether we're in college or we're starting work. Um, I have many friends that are now engaged or married um, or like one of them just announced that they're having their own child. And so to be able to have this um, worldview, to be able to, yeah, treat others and change the culture that we live in from a culture of death to a culture of life, um, as well as to be able to um, form those entrusted to us if we all are called to 
um, a marriage or if we're called to the religious life, um, to be able to form them as um, those who respect the inherent dignity of life at every stage. Yes. Wow. Um, that too. But going off on what you were sharing, so what's, I know people today are like, well, um, I'm personally pro-life, but I know you're not, or like, I'm partially pro-life. What, what's, how can we um, uh, talk about this problem where people are only personally pro-life? Yeah, um, I think the, the place to start is with scripture and with the Lord's own words, right? So um, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus, uh, or Jesus is asked, um, what is the greatest commandment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Jesus' response is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and I think obviously, yeah, we get we kind of get the first one, um, but the second commandment I think um, is uh, what is most particular in answering this question um, because, yeah, in loving our neighbor as ourselves, we know that they are a gift, um, just as we are a gift. Um, and we know that, and we are actually called by virtue of the fact that we exist in the family of the human race. And if we're baptized Christians in the family of God, um, to love and care for our neighbor. Um, and that's really what the Christian life is, is it's not your own personal holiness, but it's to say, I want to be in heaven with God and all of the angels and saints, and I want everyone else to be there with me. Um, and so that's something that obviously impacts all of our lives. And so as this impacts us being um, personally pro-life, um, is that it's not just something that I want for myself, right? If, if like, you know, God forbid something happens to me um, where I'm, you know, like sexually assaulted um, and conceive a child, I'm, I, it's not just that I would be the one to choose life, but uh, if I have a friend in that situation, I have had friends in that situation, right? I want to support her, um, not only for her own sake and her own healing, because abortion is not just something that's going to um, end the life of her child, but it's also something that's going to harm her potentially physiologically, psychologically, definitely spiritually. Um, I don't want that just for myself, right? And like anything, if you have something that is good, you don't want to keep it for yourself. You want to share it, right? Like we know the Lord. That's not something we want to keep to ourselves, right? Because the Lord offers us um, the gift of eternal life. That's something we want to share with everybody. Um, and um, yeah, I just think Sister uh, Sister Byrne, is that her name? Who just spoke recently at the uh, Republican National Convention? Yeah. Her speech was like three minutes, and it was so good. She she said in her line in her speech, she said, "I'm not just like pro life, I'm pro eternal life." Mm -hmm. um, and I think this impacts. Yeah, it's a little like tangent from the question that you just asked, but right, that impacts everything. Um, and understanding that if that is our heart um, for not only ourselves but for others, and right, Jesus has a heart for the whole world, um, and we're called to have our hearts be formed like Him. Then. Um, it's impossible to be personally pro-life um, because we're not just caring for that for ourselves or our own children, right? Um, but um, our friends, the other, the stranger, um, and the child in the womb. Um, continuing off of that, um, just a question that I had in mind and from what we've talked about in the past also. Um, you know how you were saying like in the cases of um, if, if a child were to be conceived in a case of sexual assault or rape or incest or like something like in that case, um, can you talk about also just like pro-life in that whole entire situation beyond just the mother and the child? Absolutely. So if we are coming from the Catholic worldview of being pro-life, which is every single person has inherent dignity and value, um, we, in this situation, there are like three people involved, right? So the person who, one, like um, committed the assault, um, the person who um, was the victim of the assault, and the child that was conceived out of um, the assault. And so in this situation, we need to be able to care for all three of these people, right? So there's a reality that there is a egregious, horrible act that is done um, to the woman who has conceived the child. 
um, and that is never ever something we need to neglect. And first and foremost, if there's any you know one of us here, if there's anyone listening that I, that is, that that is their experience, like let me be the first to say that I'm so sorry for the way that your dignity um, has not been respected and the ways that you have been violated. Um, and I pray that you um, will find great healing um, in natural ways um, and in supernatural ways. Um, and so, so the woman, right, first of all, has inherent dignity and value, um, which has been disregarded. And, and so there's justice that needs to be served in the sense of um, a punishment for the crime, right? But when we look at the punishment of the crime, do we say that um, the person who has committed this egregious act deserves to die, right? Do we say that, that now that they've done something horrible that they deserve to die as Catholics? We can't, and and we ought not to, right? Um, because really, what our hope for them is that uh, is that they come to know um, the heinousness of what they've done, um, but also and ultimately um, the mercy of God um, and His ability, um, yeah, to forgive their sins and to transform their lives um, and transform them to become more like Him um, and to love like Him. Um, and I think. Um, yeah, a really beautiful example of this is St. Maria of Goretti. I knew it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it if you didn't, because I love her story yeah. so much. Yeah. Oh, she's actually my patron saint, so she's my confirmation saint. She's so I love her my so spiritual much. director. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I love that. Oh, she's beautiful. So, yeah, St. Maria of Goretti, for any of those listening who don't know who she is, um, she was martyred um, around the age of 12. Um, by a 19-year-old um, named Alessandro, and um, Alessandro had attempted to um, sexually assault her, and Maria of Goretti had um, responded to him saying, no, this is a sin, this is not what God wants, and, um, and her heart was not only, right, her heart was not like a place of fear in the sense of like something bad happening to her, but, um, but a holy fear in the sense of, um, her uh, her attacker Alessandro, um, want, not wanting him to commit a mortal sin, not wanting him to commit grave matter, um, and really caring for his soul. Um, and so Alessandro ends up um, stabbing her 14 times, and she ends up bleeding out and dying. And she she's a martyr, um, and she's a patron saint of purity. And Alessandro ends up going to prison, and uh, Saint Maria of Goretti appears to him while he's in prison a few years into his sentence. And she appears to him with 14 white lilies. And um, they're a symbol of her forgiveness, um, as well as the Lord's mercy. Um, and uh, St. Alessandro, after he uh, serves his time, he, he has a, a great conversion um, and realizing what he's done and um, a really a coming to faith. Um, and he, he goes to Maria of Goretti's mom begging for her forgiveness, um, which, yeah, is, is really beautiful in, a, in an instance of um, the Lord's mercy and his transformative power. Um, and St. Maria of Goretti's mother and Alessandro um, were at St. Maria of Goretti's canonization together. I wanted to add that really, like, shook me was when, um, when she was on the, her deathbed in the hospital, right, bleeding out. Um, I remember reading that... Um, one of her last words that she said is that I forgive. That was mm -hmm. like, it's kind of like when Jesus was on the cross, one of his last words was like, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they've done. Like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that shook me. And even up until death, that was still her desire. Not something yeah. selfish, but still something completely selfless and self-giving for his soul. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, her story is amazing. It's amazing. Amen. Yo, Saint Absolutely. St. Maria of Gretti, pray for us. Yes. Um, so to continue to answer your question, right, um, we cover the reality of the woman um, in, this, in this situation, as well as, um, right, uh, the man. Not to say that, like, women, men can't experience being um, sexually assaulted, but just in the situation of being able to conceive a child. Um, we'll continue with this. Um, so... Yeah, so he, so as Catholics, what our desire is for this man, or for the attacker, is to, um, 
is to be reformed, to encounter the Lord and his mercy, and to, to be repentant, right, and to allow the Lord to transform him. Um, so given that, and we cannot disregard, right, this man or this person's life um, that has um, inherent dignity and value. So something like him receiving the death penalty, if it's, if it's in the case of, right, where we live in the United States, where we can very easily um, have that person be incarcerated um, for their for their life, entire life until they become um, until they like nat- die of natural causes, right? The the important thing here is that we are not the ones intentionally ending the life of a human being, um, uh, and that so that being said, leading into the child that's conceived. Um, in in this sexual assault uh the child itself first of all has done nothing wrong um second of all right by virtue of the fact that the child exists like uh that child has inherent human dignity and value because god willed it god willed it to be and i i have a friend who is uh who was conceived in rape and i can tell you that her life has the exact dignity of me who was conceived by um, to people who are in the sacrament of matrimony, right? And so um, as Catholics, we uh, we first and foremost need to honor um, the fact that this woman has had a heinous act done against her um, and help her to obtain, yeah, the healing that she needs, um, but also um, support and encourage her to make the best decision for herself and for the child. Um, and, yeah, and then honor the dignity of, Uh, the attacker, as well as the child in the womb. So another question um, that I've heard pretty often is, um, for those who are pro-lifers, does that mean that they're anti-choice? And can you touch upon, (laughs) like, addressing that question? It's, unfortunately, it's a very common question. Um, So if you can please, Mm -hmm. yeah. (laughs) Uh Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's really important, first of all, to acknowledge, um, yeah, the difference, like, again, right, what I acknowledged at the beginning, the difference between between being pro- politically pro-life um, as far as Catholic pro-life, um, and in that, um, acknowledging that, politically speaking, um, people who are pro-choice, the choice that's being offered um, is my life or the child, right? It's, it's an either or. And something that's really beautiful about being Catholic is we always come from the mindset of both and, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's not my life or the child, it's my life and the child, what I need to consider. Um, And so with that being said, like, as Catholics, we are 100% anti the choice of abortion. But that doesn't mean we're anti people having choices, right? Or people giving, giving people um, are allowing the pre- people the freedom to choose and honoring the their own free will that the Lord has given them. Um, but yeah, our responsibility as um, people who exist in society is um, to never ever vote for something that will uh, destroy life, um, which the only thing that abortion does is destroy life um, and the life of an innocent child nonetheless. Um, and so... Yeah, so in, in continuing with that thought, um, being um, anti-choice in, in the regard of anti the choice of abortion, um, we're actually like uh, pro giving her all the options, right? So I, when I had a friend who, was, who found herself in a crisis pregnancy as a product, as a, the result of being sexually assaulted, um, when we had talked about what she wanted to do, uh, she thought that her options were like, I keep the child and I like, don't know how to support myself or, um, or him, or I like have an abortion and I don't want to do that. Um, or like I, I put him in foster care and he has a horrible life. Um, And in my conversation with her, she, like, had no idea that something like an open adoption was an option, Uh, something like a closed adoption was an option, Um, something like her being able to choose who the family was, something like she had no idea that the option, she had the option of going um, and finding finding support 
um, of a maternity home where she could live there for the first year um, right, and be able to support her child. Um, she like had no idea of any of these things because every conversation in the world is right my life or the child's life. Um, and as Catholics, um, the choice is never um, right my life or the child's life. The choice is to receive the gift that God has given us, right? To receive the gift of our own life, to receive the opportunity um, to further his work of redemption by not continuing this cycle of death and violence against someone, um, but to uphold uh, the gospel of life um, and the work of redemption um, by choosing, yeah, our life and the life of the child. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. <laughs> Without a doubt, it really did. Um, I saw, a, I saw, this was a while ago, I took a screenshot and I remember when I was looking through my photos yesterday that I came across it, but um, in regards to like the foster care, I've seen someone comment, um, you know, like, you know, I grew up in foster care, I was someone whose like parents didn't want or like a child conceived in rape, but um, I still think my life is, you know, with so much dignity. Um, but it just sucks that there are people out there who are saying that my life like doesn't matter. And um, it's so true. Like I, I've been asked before a question, like I gave a pro-life workshop and I, I've been asked before the question, like, but what if, like, what if the child, like, how's the child going to grow up knowing that they were like conceived in um, sexual assault or rape? And I said, well, at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we don't know, we don't know how the child is going to grow up but at least they have that chance to like live their life and pursue their faith and to journey with God um, instead of not pursuing that at all. Mm -hmm. And it was just try. it was, um, I just feel like a lot of people, it, it's so hard to get that message across today's culture of, you know, everyone um, needs the chance to like journey with God and be there with God and everyone can take their sufferings and make them into joy. They could suffer well. Um, but that's like, I mean, that's a whole other topic too. I mean, it relates, but that, that's just something that we really need to, um, I feel like needs more in this culture. Okay. Question I wanted to ask you is I've had some people say, um, I had someone ask me, what do, she's a teacher and she says, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to practice being Catholic because I have kids that come up to me and say, or I have kids that like, they were, they were conceived in in vitro fertilization, um, how how like she knows that you know man and woman sacrament of marriage you know we have children um how how do we handle like in vitro fertilization i'm not even sure what my question is but i hope you can take that in and comment with you what you will yeah yeah um well first of all i just love to share this shirt that i'm wearing because um this is so it's a shirt that says having the right to do a thing is not the same thing as doing what is right Mm -hmm. um and it's a it's a gift from a friend of mine who was conceived in in vitro fertilization um and she gave it to me as a birthday present and said michelle take this as a sign of my conversion to being authentically pro-life um wow. and yeah and so just really really beautiful right um and i so yeah i guess speaking from my experience with her um I found out that she was conceived in in vitro fertilization. And um, at this point, I didn't know if she knew that that was against the church teachings, um, ergo against right God's plan for um, how children are to be brought in the world um, or naturally to be brought in the world. And so I just asked her like, like, what do you, you know, think about that? How does that make you feel? um things like that and and for her it was kind of like I don't know that's just like how I like came to be you know um and then we we had had conversation about yeah did you know that the church says that this is wrong and she um was like yeah I don't really like think that it's wrong or get that it's wrong because like I wouldn't be here without it but like I'm Catholic so I don't really know like how to reconcile that mm. you know um, and honestly, it was just a continued conversation and, and something in our conversation was, um, affirming the fact that no matter how she came into the world, like God willed her life to exist, you know, by virtue of the fact that she's a human being, um, 
she, like she's loved by God so much so that Jesus died for her in order to be with her for all of eternity, just like each of us um, who were conceived by natural means. Um, and yeah, I honestly didn't know how to approach the conversation. And I think even now, it's not something that like needs to be sorted out in our head, right? Because I think I think that something like in vitro and um, talking to someone who is um, who was conceived in in vitro, I think the response is really like, you are you are so good and you are so loved, and like I just really invite you to, to like ask the Lord, um, you know, to first and foremost affirm that. Um, but also like convict you of why, what, like why the way you were conceived is not, um, is not like proper to the natural order. Right. Um, And I think that's, that's really something that's the Lord's work. Right. Because sure. I can tell you, right. That it, it violates the the nature and uh, the dignity of sex um, by, you know, trying to conceive a child in in vitro fertilization. Um, But I can't, you know, like console the fact that, someone um, is experiencing infertility, right? That's not, that's not my work. I can, I can like, you know, walk with you and say, you know, I'm so sorry. That is so hard. Like, can I pray with you? I'll continue to pray for you. But really the person um, who is the comforter, right, is God. Um, And so I think that's really the the work of the Lord, but always, always, always acknowledging the fact that by virtue of the fact that the Lord allowed their life, um, to be conceived in in vitro, um, that they are good um, and that they are loved and that they have the exact same dignity and value that, that everybody else does. Wow. Thank you for that answer. I, even myself, like I have trouble um, knowing how to re- respond to that too because all I know is the church teaching. And um, it's like it was hard for me to even just put myself put myself in those shoes as well as like being conceived in that way and i know like um like my my parents they could they can no longer have children like after me ever since my dad had cancer like it was impossible for them to have another child again even though they wanted to and like they were offered in vitro but um they didn't choose it because like my dad didn't want it that way and like of the church teaching but there was always like that thought in me also thinking like but what if um but yeah just thank you for touching upon that topic i also think that's um uh if you guys don't know timory millington oh her last name changed she got married um she's a pro-life speaker in the um she's a pro-life speaker i met her at a conference one time but she used that analogy where um well it, it does break my heart when people say like oh i don't want a child with down syndrome it's like saying, okay, well, what about those who are born right now? Are you saying that we should just get rid of them? And um, she says like, you know, when you use that argument, when you're trying to defend life, it's something that can really, um, really make people think. And I think about it all the time too, because I, um, I uncle with, um, with dementia and he had a stroke. So he's handicapped, disabled, lives with me and my family. And it's not easy, especially if you guys, um, for those don't know, dementia is just like, the deterioration of the brain and it sometimes it makes it so difficult but his life is still worth living like his life and even though it's hard for us like that's the joys that's mm-hmm. the cross that like we carry and um i just love like my mom's the one who gave me the example you know taking care of this is her brother i was saying like you know what like he's still he's still human being still like has his dignity so um i just wanted to like throw that in you know we there's so many people that that do have um, the extra chromosome, that do are disabled, whatever it is, but we are pro-life for all life, you know, for all life. Yeah, Yeah. you know, I love that you said that. Um, And yeah, thank you so much for sharing about um, your uncle because um, my favorite person in the whole world is my Nana. And um, my Nana just passed away this past uh, December. And, she is someone who had dementia and for as long as I can remember her she had dementia and she um yeah slowly but surely like had no idea who I was um but when I would go to visit her and spend time with her um it was really an encounter with the living God um in saying that um I would see her and she would say I love you you're so beautiful 
beautiful. Thank you for coming to see me. And sent, and just like give me kisses, give me hugs, and any friend that I brought with me, even if she had never met them. Someone just like looked at her and said, hi, Nana, or hi, Lillian. And she would give them a hug and give them a kiss and say, I love you, and you are so beautiful, and you are so good. Um, and that's like what the Lord says to each of us, you know? Um, and yeah, and so I just, I couldn't imagine my life without my Nana. If, if, you know, if we as a family said, well, Nana has dementia, so her life's not worth living and, you know, euthanasia is an option, so let's do it. Um, like, I don't know how I would have got through college because I went and visited my Nana every week and I brought friends from my Bible study to meet my Nana because I was like, man, these people, like people just need to know that they're good and that they're loved. Um, and I don't know how to do that, but my Nana just had this gift, just this pure gift to say, you are good and you're loved and people knew it. People knew it. Um, so, yeah. So thanks for sharing that, Janelle. And yeah. God rest my Nana's soul. Um, pray for the repose of her soul. And yeah, she's someone I really, I really um, want to emulate in my life. Um, yeah. And I definitely see that you are, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Okay, our last question. Yeah. So just to wrap it up, for those listening at home, any resources you can recommend? Yes. Okay. I think I sent you guys like 20 resources. <laughs> but they're in different categories. They're in different categories. So when, when we put them in the show notes, uh, people will be able to see that. So um, let's see. What did I send you? Yes. Okay. So first and foremost, um, uh, hope and healing and crisis intervention when it comes to um, abortion. So um, the Sisters of Life, I have already mentioned them before, um, but they are a beautiful, beautiful order of religious women um, who serve women in crisis pregnancies, uh, men and women who need healing from abortion, um, as well as um, college students knowing their own worth and dignity. So um, I sent you guys a link to one of my favorite talks from Sister Bethany Madonna called Receiving the Promise. Um, That's what you and shared. so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did that. And that was like the turning point in college. Thank you for sending me that. Yes, watch that, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, they have really beautiful litanies to pray with. One of them is called the Litany of Trust, and the other one um, is Magnificat with Mary. Um, and so, yeah, I just encourage everyone to get their hands on one of those and to pray with those. Um, they're also super helpful if you ever find yourself walking with someone who's in a crisis pregnancy or um, has had an abortion and you don't know what to do. I called their crisis pregnancy line when I was walking with a friend and said, hi, I'm not pregnant, but I'm having a crisis for my friend who's pregnant. And I, think it's <laughs> I love that. Um, and they joyfully received me and yeah, are a huge reason to why uh, my friend's son is now three and a half. Um, so yeah, so there's that. And then um, if you know anyone who's working in the abortion industry and or you yourself are um, and you want to get out, um, there is uh, the abortionworker.com, um, which is the group by Abby Johnson called And Then There Were None. Um, and then also Rachel's Vineyard, which is probably something that uh, many of your dioceses offer, which is again, um, healing um, after abortion. Um, so there's the hope and healing crisis intervention um, section and then apologetics and church documents. So yeah, I'm, we obviously didn't cover a lot of apologetics here. Um, and so I'm sure many of the listeners are hungry to hear more. Um, so first and foremost, I'd love to point everyone um, to Stephanie Connor, formerly Stephanie Gray. Um, she's the author of the book, Love Unleashes Life. Um, and she really speaks about pro-life apologetics from a Catholic worldview and just does a great job of delineating um, and breaking down um, arguments um, and speaks with such charity um, to every single person. person. So, um, yeah, one of my favorites I've also linked here is her appearance on the Pines with Aquinas podcast um, talking about pro-life apologetics. So it's loveunleasheslife.com, and then there's also a link to that um, specific podcast. Um, church documents. Uh, that I think everybody should read um, are Humana Vitae. It talks a lot about, um, yeah, contraception and the sexual revolution. And it's a, it's a prophetic document, um, which was written before the sexual revolution and now us living after the sexual revolution. Um, it shows us um, 
yeah, how how welcoming certain things into our lives um, lead to uh, the demise of human of uh, the family and um, the cultivation of a culture of death. And yep. And then I'm talking really fast. <laughs> it's like <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot. Um, <laughs> And then uh, Evangelium Vitae, which is the Gospel of Life by Pope John Paul II, um, he, uh, yeah, just really breaks down um, what the Gospel of Life is um, and how we ought to approach it, especially um, with beginning and end of life issues. And then um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Articles 5 and 6, there's also links um, that I sent you all, um, so hopefully we can put those in the show notes. Um, that goes more into depth about, yeah, what we believe about um contraception, IVF, abortion, death penalty, um, things like that. And then um, staying informed and taking action. So one of the biggest things as Catholic young adults that we have um, the privilege, the freedom, and the honor to do, and really the responsibility, um, is to stay informed and uh, to take action. So um, first and foremost, your parish uh, or your diocese respect life ministries. Um, find opportunities to volunteer at, um, yeah, homes for uh, uh, women and families in crisis pregnancies, anybody experiencing any sort of, like, um, homelessness, things like that. Um, and, yeah, many of the groups go and pray in front of Planned Parenthood. Um, so those are, that's also great. Um, live action, um, yeah, they are just really on, on top of sharing about, um, what's happening in the world as far as um, um, abortion goes and, um, yeah, in our politics, things like that. Um, and, yeah, just also understanding what abortion is. Um, and they have a lot of really good videos, really good short videos explaining different types of abortions as well as um, doctors talking about the fact that abortion is never medically necessary. Um, so that's a super good resource. And then um, Students for Life, especially if you're a student um, in college, you get involved in those groups. Um, the March for Life, I have yet to be, go to one, but that is a top three on my list of things to do in my <laughs> life. Um, and then participating in the 40 Days for Life, which is coming up at the end of September. Um, they've saved over, um, I, they, yeah, they've saved very many, many, many children um, and women um, from abortion. Um, so participating in 40 Days for Life is beautiful um, and really shows our dependence on the Lord um, and trust in him as the Lord, the giver, and the author of life. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, um, I have a movie, a documentary, and a course for anyone interested. So um, you might have heard of Unplanned. Um, I encourage all of you to watch it. If you haven't, um, host a movie night uh, via, you know, the internet or I don't, wherever, whatever the COVID restrictions are currently, it's possible to watch this with people, just saying. Mm -hmm. um, and then Unprotected is also a really great movie. It's about um, Humana Vitae and the sexual revolution. Um, and uh, yeah, there are links to there. And then the last thing is Save, Save Lives You. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, um, I do work for FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Um, and there is a series on accompaniment with those who are in crisis to save lives. And Abby Johnson speaks in it. One of the Sisters of Life speaks in it. Lila Rose um, from Live Action speaks in it. Um, and it's just a really good resource um, to help you be able to accompany um, someone. So that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. You. And any last thoughts? That, like any last thing that you'd want to just share before we end this? Yeah. Um, having, yes, so having a pro-life worldview, having a pro-life mindset um, really starts in our hearts. Um, and first and foremost, right, the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so you yourself need to know the gift that you are. And so um, in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus' prayer to the Father, uh, Jesus says, Father, they are your gift to me. Where I am, I wish that they might also be. Um, and Jesus literally says that each of us are a gift from the Father. So I first and foremost want to remind each of you to know, Kat and Daniel, that you are a gift 
um, and every single person listening uh, that you are a pure gift um, and and invite you to go before the Lord and ask him to reveal to you the gift that you are. Um, ask him to see yourself through his eyes um, and then, you know, in turn, um, ask him to transform your eyes so that you can see everybody in that same light, no matter uh, what they are experiencing in life or where they're coming from. Um, and then, um, yeah, also, you know, I'm sure that there are things that we've talked about or a lot of things that the church teaches um, about being pro-life that people struggle with. And so I want to just encourage you that um, it's okay to be at a place where you're where you don't understand or, you know, something doesn't sit right with you. Um, but don't just leave it there. You know, take that to the Lord. Take that to a trusted friend. Um, talk to them. You know, take it to your priest. Ask your priest to explain this to you. Um, you know, don't just don't just leave it there and say, I, you know, this is hard, so I don't want to. Um, my encouragement is really to dive into it. Um, please, 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 everybody read uh, Humana Vitae and Evangelium Vitae. Um, you will not be disappointed. They also sound really difficult to read because I just said them in Latin, but I promise <laughs> you they are written in lay people language. You yeah. can all understand. Yes. Um, but it's, um, yeah, we all grew up in the culture of death. And so, um, like St. Paul says, we need to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And that's a great way to do it um, by listening to the, the work of the saints um um yeah john paul ii um pope paul the sixth um yeah and really asking for the saints to intercede for you um in a particular way pope saint john paul ii um as someone who had a huge hand in defeating communism um but also um affirming the gospel of life and really like articulating it um and someone who lived it right when he was shot he went to prison to the man who shot him mm -hmm. and offered him forgiveness before the man even apologized and said, if not for but the grace of God, I would be where you are. And just that reality of, of living in humility um, of the gift that we are and the gifts that we've been given. Um, so those are my encouragements to everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such a beautiful <laughs> talk. We, we've learned so much ourselves. Thank you so much, Michelle. And we will end this episode in prayer. Michelle, if you can please lead us. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, defender of life, teach us to pray. Come, Holy Spirit, Lord, the giver of life, teach us to pray. Come, Father, creator, and author of life, teach us to pray. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of Life, please pray for us. God, we thank you for the gift of this day and for the gift of our lives. We thank you for um, the gift of our parents and receiving the gift of our lives. Um, and for all of those who have honored um, the gift of our lives, for um, those teaching us um, by how they treat us, the fact that we are a gift. Um, we ask you to teach us your mercy um, and your forgiveness for all of those who have failed to um, treat us as gift and for the ways that we have failed to treat others as gift. Um, Lord, we um, yeah, just place before you anyone um, who is um, experiencing suffering. Um, we ask that you um, make a bold invitation to unite their suffering to yours so that it may be um, for uh, your greater glory and for the work of redemption and for their sanctification. Um, we offer to you anyone who um, is contemplating suicide or abortion today, that they might know the gift of life and that they might choose life, that um, they might have friends and individuals come into their life um, to help support them. Lord, um, I offer to you, each of our listeners, um, that they might know the gift of their life, um, that they might be given the gift and the grace of courage uh, and great zeal for life so that they might be able to defend life and to um, support life. Jesus, um, we just entrust ourselves to
to you, to your most sacred heart, um, through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, under her title of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of Life, as we pray, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy we hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. St. John Paul II. Pray for, Pray for us. Yes. St. Maria of Goretti. Pray for us. Saint Gianna Bredamola. <laughs> Pray for us. And all, all holy angels and saints. Pray for, Pray for us. us. Pray for us. So, um, everyone, thanks again for listening to this podcast. Thank you again, Michelle, for being with us. We're going to put all the resources that she mentioned in this video um, in the link. In the links below, we'll put some links. Uh, also, feel free to contact us, message us if you can't seem to open up a link. Um, thank you again, Michelle, and Yak out. Yeah.